Good morning, my name is John and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Christchurch Stockport Online. Wherever you are and however you've happened to find your way here, it's so great that you've joined with us this morning. Now during this service, we're going to be singing songs, we're going to be approaching God in prayer, we're going to be reading his word, the Bible, and then hearing a sermon from that word. Everything you'll need for this service will either appear on the screen before you, or if you head over to our Facebook page and join our church group, you can download a service sheet and you'll also find some materials for families to work through with their children. In the description of this video, there's also a link to Bible Gateway, where you can access today's Bible passage. You see, we believe that the Bible is God's word, and therefore we want you to be able to see what the Bible says for yourselves. More than that, we want everyone, both young and old, to hear and understand what the Bible says, because ultimately the message of the Bible is good news for all. Listen to how the prophet Isaiah puts it in Isaiah chapter 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. He has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Isaiah is saying that God's word is good news for all mankind. And as Bible history unfolds, we find out that the good news is all about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The one who actually came to bring the peace and salvation that Isaiah proclaimed. Well, let's sing now of that amazing salvation in our first hymn. Self we 
the song we've just sang speaks of the salvation of our God. But salvation from what? Well, listen to the words of the Apostle John as he wrote his first letter to Christians spread around the world in the first century. He said, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John is saying that we, the rescue we need, the, the salvation is from our sin. We all need forgiveness from our sin. Uh, to think otherwise actually would be to deceive ourselves. So let's just take a moment and be real with ourselves and real with God. And then we'll say the words of the confession that appears on the screen together, acknowledging our complete dependence on God and our reliance on Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Let's say together, Almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, we confess to you. We confess with our whole hearts our neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, our wrongdoing, thinking and speaking, the hurts we have done to others and the good we have left undone. Oh God, forgive us for we've sinned against you and raise us to newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to continue in an attitude of prayer now, as Luke Robinson leads our prayers. Let us pray. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, as we have been learning about in Genesis, is a great and mighty God, above all things and yet working in and through all things. A God who is outside of time, who has seen the end of time before the beginning even came to be, and yet who is with us every moment, who sees us and knows us. A God who is so powerful he can cause mountains to rise up from flat plains, can cause the seas to part with not a puddle left in between. He can gather up sands to form deserts and empty clouds to fill rivers. And yet he is a God who carries every drop of blood around our bodies. He draws in every breath we breathe. He knows every hair on our heads and every thought inside of them. And he cares about all of it, from the greatest mountain to the smallest cell, and even us who are in between. Thank you, Father, that you cared so much for us, that you clothed us in Christ's righteousness, so that we who are in him, although full of sin, may be holy and blameless in your sight. Thank you that you not only see us that way, but also be because of your great love, you adopted us through Christ into your family, that we may have a relationship with you, our Father in heaven. We thank you that you are a Father who listens to his children, who hears and answers prayers. We thank you that you have worked uh, in helping Ben and Lawrence to find a place to live this week. For providing too for Christchurch Stockport in every way during the past three years. But especially for the people that you have brought together. And continue to bring in. Forming this church here in Stockport. We thank you that the growth you're bringing about here is not just in the numbers but also in wisdom, in revelation, in knowledge and in faith of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ.
we thank you that, uh, for that. And we pray that that may continue as we go into this fourth year of Christ Church Stockport's existence. And may it never cease until we are with you in your presence, with all wisdom and perfect revelation. And as we look to our future, where you will wipe away every tear, where there will be no more death, no more mourning or crying, no more pain or suffering, we pray you would comfort those now who are mourning loved ones. Help those who are suffering or in pain to trust you and to keep their eyes fixed on what is to come if they are in Christ. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work, opening the eyes of those we know who don't know you yet. Open their hearts uh, of those who don't know Christ as their saviour and that don't have your spirit as a deposit guarantee in that future inheritance. Lord, work a miracle in their lives. Let me pray that you may uh, give the Holy Spirit to us who are listening or watching this service. Work within us to know you better and change our lives so that we may live as the sons you adopted us to be. Live like the Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
I'm now going to hand over to Jane, our children's worker, as she continues with the New City Catechism. It's a great chance to learn together the truths about the reality of our God. Hey, this is our series looking at big truths of the Bible. This week is question 33. Should those who have faith in Christ seek their salvation through their own works or anywhere else. So those who believe, do they have to work for their salvation? Do they have to earn it? What is it that Christians have to do to be saved? Is it lots and lots of things? Our answer, no. Everything necessary to salvation is found in Christ. Salvation is through faith alone and in Christ alone. Should those who have faith in Christ seek their salvation through their own works or anywhere else? No. Everything necessary to salvation is found in Christ. For us to be able to see, we need light. But if I turn this light off, we can't see anything. If I open my eyes wider, I still can't see. If I put my glasses on, I still can't see. But if I turn the light back on, we can see. To be able to see, we need one thing, light. To have salvation, we only need one thing. Christ. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing extra. Salvation is through faith alone, Christ alone. In the book of Galatians in the Bible, in chapter 2, verse 16, it says, Yet we know that, in, that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Should those who have faith in Christ seek their salvation through their own works or anywhere else? No. Everything necessary to salvation is found in Christ. That is so exciting. See you next week for question 34. Well, this morning's reading is Genesis chapter 41, and it will be appearing on the stream. But as I said earlier, you can also follow the link in the description of this video to Bible Gateway. Genesis 41. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of corn, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning, his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offences today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams for us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. 
And as he inter interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office and the baker was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favourable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in the, all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have, un have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears, withered, thin and blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that come up after them are seven years, and the seven empty years blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. As I have told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout the land of Egypt, but after them there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish throughout the famine. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom there is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand, and put it on Joseph's hand, and clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain around his neck. Then he made him ride in his second chariot, and they called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no, no one shall lift up a hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephanath Paner, and he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly. And he gathered up all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and put the food in the cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Seneth, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph has said. There was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, what he says you do. 
So when the famine had spread over the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. Well, it's time to hand over to Matt, who will explain, encourage and exhort us from this passage. Well, good morning. It's great to have my welcome to that of John's. Let's pray and then we'll dig into Genesis chapter 41. Uh, the author to the Hebrews writes this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Lord and Heavenly Father, we pray that we would see Jesus today. Uh, lift our hearts from uh, the pits of despair to the heights of joy. Uh, let us see Christ's glory uh, and let us glory in him. Amen. We're in a season of uh, patient uh, endurance right now, aren't we? As we scour our news apps and we watch uh, our government briefings, all for news that the spring might be coming and with it a loosening of restrictions. And we've been promised much. Uh, vaccines that bring hope, the return to school, hugs for grandma, even uh, the great British summer. Uh, but I don't know about you, but I have days where I think to myself, the waiting is hard. Everything seems so hopeless. There are new strains. There's more deaths reported. There's another day of internet glitches which interferes with homeschooling. And my patience, well, it wears thin. And as a Christian, as my patience dwindles, well, there are other questions that start to get asked. Good questions like my daughter's question the other day of, well, why doesn't God just step in and sort it all? Thoughts of maybe God isn't there or he isn't able or he doesn't love us after all. What on earth is God doing? And of course, whilst COVID and lockdown are obvious examples, they're not the only things that leave us asking those sorts of questions, are they? As we or those we love face other horrific illnesses or we experience the heartache of broken relationships or we see and experience the effects of poverty or injustice or immorality. When we have those times where being a Christian rather than bringing us peace brings hostility from a world that hates God and his word. Or simply those moments where we hit a milestone birthday or the beginning of a new year and we begin to take stock of our lives and we realise that, well, life hasn't actually turned out as we had hoped. That the good life is, well, at best mediocre and we're left wondering, is there any hope? Will it get better? Are all God's promises of blessing and abundance and good pastures and still, still water and peace, are they true? Has God overpromised and underdelivered? Which is why this episode in the Joseph narrative, I think, is so important for us to get our heads around today. Because we begin here, there in verse 1, with with Joseph still in prison for a crime that he did not commit. He's been sold into slavery by his brothers. He's been falsely accused of rape by his owner's wife. And now verse 23 of chapter 40, he's been forgotten for two years by the one man who has the ear of the Pharaoh and could have got our man Joseph out of the prison hole that he's in. Things have been going from bad to worse for Joseph. And what's more, and why this is important, is because this isn't the way that he or we would expect things to have been going for him. Because do you remember Joseph's dreams? Two dreams that you could argue got him in this mess in the first place. We're back in chapter 37 and verse 5. Through his dreams, God has told Joseph that Joe was going to rise to rule his family of promise. A family who were promised a, a bright future of uh, land and descendants and blessing. Uh, the family who we've been told all the way through Genesis were going to restore the fortunes of this broken world and end the curse wrought upon us by our first parents, Adam and Eve. Joseph was to rule it all. Uh, this was a great promise of blessing. Uh, and yet, despite all the grandiose promises, as we hit this chapter, we find that this God-announced chosen ruler of the family of blessing, the one God has gone all in with, is sitting abandoned and forgotten in a foreign pit. 
Verse 46 tells us that for at least 13 years, Joseph has been far from home, far from blessing and far from the fulfilment of God's promises. And so we could forgive him, right? If as he sits in his prison cell, he's a little bit miffed with God or has given up on God's promises altogether, yeah? If his patience was running a little thin or his hope was dwindling, if he was asking those questions that we were asking a moment ago, has, has God over promised and now found he can't deliver? Except remarkably, in the context of all that we have seen in Joseph's life, what I think is worth marvelling on in this passage is that that's not Joseph's response at all. Now look what happens as the story moves forward. Because as, as Joseph languishes in the pit there, well, verse 1, Pharaoh is having his own nightmare. As these horror cows and the animated ears of corn eat their fat friends. Now we read that and we think, well, what's scary uh, about that? But for whatever reason, and the Hebrew that this uh, is originally written in does emphasise horror in the words that are used, Pharaoh is troubled. And so he calls his experts, the dream readers, the magicians, the experts, the wise men. But verse 8, there was none who could interpret the dream of Pharaoh. Until, of course, in a moment of timing that only God could foresee, the once forgotten Joseph is now remembered by the cupbearer of chapter 40 last week. All this talk of dreams seems to clear his head and triggers his memory. And verse 9, well, he says, now I remember, oh, Pharaoh, there's this guy, he's a Hebrew. He was in prison. You know when you sent me to prison that time? Yeah, he was there. And he interpreted mine and the baker's dreams. And verse 13, as he interpreted them to us, so it came about. So verse 14, Joseph now remembered all of a sudden is lifted from the pit. He's cleaned off and he's made acceptable for Pharaoh and he's sent to interpret the king's dream. But look at this, another thing I find remarkable. Here is Joseph's moment. After all the heartache he's been through, here he gets to earn himself some status. Here he gets to forge his own path to blessing and success. It's time now for him to put the whole sorry tale of his dreams of the last 13 years, the, the dreams that have led him to the pit behind him, and forge a new bond with the king of Egypt. But do you see what happens instead? Uh, the Joseph who you and I would forgive for rejecting God and his promises, who you would expect to have given up with any kind of uh, hope, whose patience with God must surely be running out, well, he does nothing of the sort. He doesn't uh, go after things himself. No, despite the last 13 years, Joe remains all in with God and his dreams. Because look at verse uh, 15. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, well, yes, actually, I am very good at this kind of thing, my mighty Pharaoh. I think you need somebody like me in your courts. Shall we talk about how many zeros you want to put after the five on my paycheck? But of course, that's not what he said. No, instead, verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favourable answer. And that phrase, it is not in me, is apparently emphatic in the original language. No, he says, I can't interpret it. But God can. Joseph, when he has his own opportunity to grasp for blessing in his own strength, wants to be absolutely clear. Dream interpretation isn't his thing, it's God's thing. At verse 25, God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. Or, or verse 28, it is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Or verse 32, I think this is the most remarkable of all because of what Joseph doesn't say again. You see, what I expect, given all the circumstances that Joseph has been through, is that he might have said this. Now, now Pharaoh, God's telling you that you're going to have seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. But, but let me level with you. God once turned up to a, a, in a dream of mine. In fact, I had two dreams like you uh, 13 years ago. And he promised me the world. But you know what? Things have been pretty pants since then. So my advice to you would be to take the dream and its interpretation with a little bit of a pinch of salt. Uh, God says these things, but, you know, the jury's out on whether he can deliver, really. But that's not Joseph's response at all, is it? 
verse 32, the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed and uh, by God and God will shortly bring it about. Joseph is utterly convinced that despite all of his suffering, that what God says, God does. Despite it all, he remains steadfastly patient. This is an exemplary man of faith. And of course, we see as the passage goes on that this faith is not misplaced at all. And that Joseph has done well to remain steadfastly patient in trusting God's promises. Because not only are Pharaoh's dreams fulfilled, but we start to see the threads of all of God's promises to Joseph. And crucially, to the family of promise beginning to pan out in abundance. So look at verse 41, where Joseph finally begins to see his dreams becoming a reality. He's lifted from the pit, he's re-robed, he's given an authority second only to the king himself, to the most powerful nation on earth, positioning him in a place, as we're going to see in the coming weeks, where he's able to save the family of promise, the family through whom God is then going to save the whole world. And again, don't miss this, because the author of Genesis doesn't want us to forget at this point that the dreams of Joseph aren't the only backdrop to the story, are they? No, there's the promise, remember, of land and descendants and blessing. And the author wants us to see that God is still at work in the life of Joseph. And in doing so, he's fulfilling his promise rescue plan for that whole world. So look at verse 49. And the grain that Joseph stores, it's like the sand of the sea, we're told. And that's a reference that should make our minds jump back to Genesis 22, where God promised to grow this family to be more numerous than what? The sand on the seashore. Which is why immediately in verse 50, we're told Joseph has two sons, two descendants. And notably, he gives them Hebrew and not Egyptian names, Manasseh, which means forgotten. Not forgotten this time in prison, but I've forgotten all my hardship. A blessing is coming. And then Ephraim, which means fruitful. God is still at work growing his people. And that people, remember, are to be a blessing to the whole world. And with that in mind, look at verse 56. When the famine had spread all over the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine, excuse me, was severe over all the earth. Through this man Joseph, the world, and as we'll see in the coming weeks, Joseph's family are blessed as they find grain in Egypt. This passage, it brings about so many strands of God's promises through this one man, Joseph. And do you see the promises are filled in abundance, right? God not only delivers, but he delivers in spades. But here's the thing. The only way that this has come about is as Joseph is sold into slavery in order that he's brought to Egypt. As Joseph is falsely and unjustly accused so that he's placed in prison. As Joseph is forgotten in order to be remembered to Pharaoh at just the right time. So that he might raise up to, rise up to be the saviour of the land, the family and the world and the fulfilment of all of God's promises. Joseph has to go into the pit in order to then rise to glory. This is a rags to riches story. It's great, isn't it? And Joseph finally, after all this time, all this suffering, is crowned with glory and honour, clothed in royal robes, able to effect a rescue for the world with his abundant stores of grain. And God is seen to have been in control throughout. Oh, no doubt Joseph had his, his wobbles and his moments, his what the heck is going on. And no doubt there were times where his patience grew thin and his despair grew great, but he kept on with God. And in doing so, God's faithfulness to Joseph and his promises was seen to be very great. Nothing thwarted God, did it? And in God's very good time, everything falls beautifully into place, not only for Joseph, but for the family of promise and for the good of the whole world. Which I think in our frustrations and our pains and our hardships that we began with is massive to remember. Because we started, didn't we, asking if perhaps God has promised much but is unable to deliver. 
But here we see the majesty of God's plans, the wisdom of God's timing. This world is not a rudderless ship buffering from wave to wave. No, it is on a course of promise fulfillment, of blessing, of salvation, of the abundant life. What God has promised, God will deliver in spades. And of course, as we've seen time and time again in this Joseph narrative, we see that even more clearly in the man Jesus who, like Joseph, was sent into this world from a far-off land on the promise of one day ruling. But he, like Joe, was rejected, falsely accused, and then lifted onto a cross before being laid in the pit of his grave. And just as we started to ask, has God failed with Jesus? Has God over-promised and under-delivered? Has sin and death won? Well, it's at that point in God's perfect timing that up from the grave, Jesus rose and we're told, therefore, God has highly exalted him and has bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus goes down to the pit and he is exalted. There is a better Joseph, the fulfilment of all of God's plans, the one who says not simply come to me for grain so that I can you can make bread, but I am the bread of life. Come to me and you will never go hungry. Uh, Jesus is the one who brings the abundant fulfilment of God's promises. He is the one who has risen to rule. He is the one who will rescue you and me from the famine and suffering of this barren land. But as I finish, I want you to see the pattern. Because this rags to riches story isn't simply Joseph's story. It's not simply Jesus' story. But it's our story too. You see, if Joseph's path to glory, if the Lord Jesus' path to glory is one of suffering. Then friends, I think we need to know that our path to glory will be the same. Patient, faith-filled, suffering now. That we might rise to glory then. Because listen to these words from uh, 1 Peter. It's a letter written to a persecuted, suffering church. 1 Peter uh, 5 and verse 6. It says this. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. So that at the proper time he may, may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, friends, we don't suffer as those who have no hope. God has made us big promises to bring us to glory. He has paved the way to glory through his son, Jesus. And now as we wait, yes, we do in a sin fueled broken world, but we do so knowing that we are not on a rudderless ship. But instead, God is bringing all things together in his good timing, in his sovereignty. And one day into the future, as we are clothed ourselves in white linen, raised to rule with our brother Jesus, then we will look back at God's salvation plan and the way that he has used even our descent into the pit for our glory. And we will marvel at his plans. We will will delight in his sovereignty. We will worship him for his salvation. But until then, we must wait patiently enduring, trusting in the promises of God, knowing that God hasn't promised more than he can deliver and that one day into the future this brokenness will end and our eternal glory will begin. So friends, wait patiently, endure, keep trusting and know that Christ will one day return and take you to glory. Let's pray. Oh Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this uh, life of Joseph and the way that in your sovereign timing you used him to rescue a people. We thank you for the life of uh, Jesus and that in your uh, sovereign goodness and timing you used him to uh, rescue a people. We thank you that in him you have brought us near to yourself. But Father, we recognise that there is a pattern of suffering now and glory 
later help us to uh, be a people who, in the midst of uh, a broken world with all of its uh, pains and heartaches, all of the trials that we experience, that we would cling to your promises. That we would see in this passage that you are a God who can rescue a people, a God who is sovereign over all things, a God who is in utter control and cannot be thwarted. And may that, uh, oh Lord, impress on our hearts real faith. Father, I want to pray for those in our church who at this time are finding life particularly hard, particularly burdensome, whose uh, patience is running thin, whose faith is perhaps dwindling. But Lord, may they see the way that you work through Joseph, the way you work through Jesus, the promises that you have made to us, and may you restore their faith, may you restore their hope, and may you restore their joy, we pray. May we know the joy of your salvation this morning. Amen. Well, thanks, Matt. Our, our final hymn is a reminder of our beautiful Saviour, Jesus Christ.
a big thank you for joining with us this morning. To our regulars, growth teams return this week on Tuesday and Thursday, so do be looking out for how to log into those meetings. And just to say, if this has been your first time with us this morning, then we'd love to hear from you. Do reach out to us through our social media channels or maybe through the contacts page of our website. Uh, that said, we're actually going to be holding a Zoom call right after this meeting now, where you're invited to connect with members of our church community. The details of how to dial in can be found in the comments section of this video, and you'd be most welcome to join with us. But as we finish, let's pray. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Well, thanks again for, for joining with us. And it's very difficult in these kind of COVID times with lockdown to, to do this, but maybe use this week as a, as a chance to serve others like Joseph did, uh, to reach out to others in our communities, maybe calling people up or just saying hello in the streets. Let, let's be a blessing to our communities this week. And in doing that, do look after yourselves, do look after one another, and we'll see you next time.